The God Monster of Indian Flats is an extremely low-budget movie from the mid-70s about a mutant killer sheep that rampages across the countryside, and that's the B-plot. It felt like I was watching two different movies, and someone kept changing the channel back and forth between the two of them because they were bored and couldn't decide which one to watch. I liked that they used that church hymn for the opening. <laughs> But then it did an abrupt change to the sounds of traffic and raucous band music. And then it did a transition to creepy theremin music. And then did a transition to a Western orchestral score like a Max Steiner movie. <laughs> and then it did a transition to a banjo trio. And that's all in the first two minutes. I do like that whole medley they're playing. Yeah, of course you I'm do. not joking around. I actually, I, I actually did. No, it was good. <laughs> Okay, I wondered if you were going to talk about that, because a lot of the background people in this movie, I'm assuming, are just people from the town that they were filming in, and they said, hey, you guys want to be in this movie? The whole parade, I feel like that was probably something that was already happening, and they said, let's take advantage of that. I'm pretty sure the end credits said they played themselves. The fact that we get that church hymn opening leads you to believe it's going to be a pretty standard Western film, you know, like Wild West, John Wayne type film. Yeah, until you see the actual title god monster of indian flats and you're like all right i already don't know what the hell this movie's gonna be there are a lot of weird cuts i liked when all the whole group walked towards the camera but the shot didn't cut quick enough so they're all kind of massing over the camera i actually i like some of the little weird shots and it, it feels like the the director was actually trying to make an artistically put together movie to put the camera in places that you wouldn't expect sometimes but he should have been a little better with kind of the core aspects of filmmaking before he started thinking about those things the characters all the characters all stand out as being very cartoonish but they have a lot of presence they all have very unique names barnstable silverdale madame alta even mariposa is a it's a normal name but it's not a super common name either they they were afraid of their audience getting characters mixed up or they just wanted to make their movie more unique or i don't know but they definitely thought about the names they were assigning to these characters. I felt the conversations in this movie were weird, but they were sometimes interesting. They kept my attention for the most part, just because it's a weird movie. Yeah, I, I, it felt like there were times when they tried to genuinely give, I don't want to say character, character depth, but they wanted these characters to feel like real people in a sense, distinct people. It was better than what you would expect, I think, from, from a movie as low budget and weird as this. The whole opening 10 minutes focuses on Eddie, and you think he's going to be the main character, this is setting the whole thing up, but he has nothing to do with the movie at all, either A-plot or B-plot. He has a sheep farm, and that's where the monster comes from. That's it. They keep putting him in the movie at different parts, but he doesn't do anything. He has nothing to do with anything. Even when they have somebody spying on him and Mariposa together, you assume that that's going to be something that's going to be important later, but it isn't really. It's just kind of there. So at the start of the movie, Eddie goes to a casino and wins a lot of money. And he comes in contact with a guy, again, with a unique name. It's all on me, all on Elbow Johnson. <laughs> and Elbow Johnson wants to go celebrating with him, with this guy that doesn't know him or anything. But Eddie's like, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and go along. I forgot his name was Elbow Johnson. Yeah, that was the first part <laughs> in the movie where I just, I couldn't stop laughing. I had to like go back because I didn't even know what they were saying. How would you even get the name like that? I imagine every time he wants to talk to someone, he keeps elbowing him, saying, hey, hey, it's me, and they just start calling him Elbow. <laughs> <laughs> so the first time we get some of those unique shots is when they're all driving in the car, and the camera's all over the place, and it's genuinely interesting. It, it makes it a lot more interesting than just putting the camera down on the side of the road and showing the car drive by. Well, the scene introduces the sheriff to Sheriff Gordon. Sheriff Sideburns. So Eddie is accused of... Well, that doesn't even matter. This scene doesn't go anywhere, so... <laughs> I think you could say that about every scene. <laughs> Some stuff happens here. It doesn't matter. Eddie goes back to... The uh... end. Thanks for watching. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie goes back to his farm where he's got these sheep that he's talking to and super friendly with. It's a little over the top. He just sees a lot of weird 
abstract imagery and it's very david lynch-esque i didn't understand what's going on so it felt like david lynch <laughs> so then dr clemens and mariposa who's his assistant go up to eddie's farm and they see the weird sheep embryo thing that's alive and breathing and they're cool with it right away dr clemens even pulls out his recording device right in his pocket and makes a log entry on april 21st found half-formed embryo alive and breathing Possibly the result of chromosomic breakdown and cross-fertilization. Uh, yeah, I, he was probably my favorite character. He's one of the worst actors who delivers all his lines like he's narrating a bad cartoon from Hanna-Barbera in the 60s or something. <laughs> I, and, they, I mean, they keep referring to the thing as an embryo. It's like he, he immediately starts making, not theories about what it is, but he seems to know what it is, at least on a basic level but where did it come from did it you know did it pop out of another sheep which is a question that never gets answered in the movie he calls it a hybrid organism but that's not what it is at all he's clearly not a very smart professor dr clemens says it may provide the proof i need for a certain theory of cellular realignment he throws out a lot of dumb little science quotes that don't make any sense in context or out of context just to sound like a scientist guy. And a lot of scenes with him dealing with the monster in his lab have that weird 50s sci-fi music that doesn't fit this movie at all. Respiration appears normal with still no apparent signs of physical activity. The voiceover narration and then the monster's there and you hear it like grunting and there's weird gas and... Yeah, his whole lab setup doesn't make any sense because the animal is just sitting... Sometimes it's just sitting there in the lab and they're just kind of walking around and they've got all these machines in the dark where they can't tell what the hell they're doing with them anyway. And it just seems very very unscientific and probably really dirty in there it's like somebody took a john wayne movie in one hand and an outer limits episode in the other hand and smashed them together and it didn't work but they did it anyway <laughs> i know it's called god monster of indian flats but that has less than one percent to do with the actual plot of the movie you could edit either one of those into its own movie honestly they would probably work better than they do when you put them together so Mr. Silverdale wants to preserve the historical and environmental integrity of the town. So Silverdale's conflict is he's talking to Mr. Barnstable, who's part of the Reich Corporation, a billionaire industrialist who wants to come in and buy the land. And Silverdale does not want that. So when they're in that party and Silverdale is leading Barnstable around and there's live music playing, at one point there's a single violin and a piano playing, but the music is a string quartet. Hello, Florence. Nice to see you. Tom, how's the family? And there is a cellist there, <laughs> but he's not even doing anything. He's taking a break. I enjoyed how there's a quick cut from a guy to a horse's ass. I wouldn't want to be the guy right before that cut. And it has nothing to do with that guy. It could be clever if they were showing a guy as an asshole, but they're not. I think that was a, another example of the director trying to do an artistic shot. And I'm sure people were like, why are you pointing the camera at the horse like that? That's kind of weird. But whatever, you're paying us in sandwiches, so I guess it's fine. <laughs> A guy named Philip Maldove is Silverdale's henchman, and he goes snooping around the town dump. They don't really say why. I, he seems to be trying to gather information about other people in the town to use against them, potentially. Dr. Clemens goes by to dump some stuff from his lab. The dump worker and Maldove are down there at the bottom of this big hill of crap, and Dr. Clemens just goes throwing stuff down at them, basically, and then just drives away when they're right there. I noticed that too. I love how the guys are right there. It was so obvious they were right there and he just chucks that box. He knows it's going to go right at him, but he does it anyway, just drives away. This jerk. <laughs> and they immediately open up the box and there's bloody lab equipment and stuff in there. Bloody old used gloves. They're putting their hands right in everything and he puts the glove almost right up to his nose. <sighs> yeah. I like that line that Philip says. It's been eaten away by this foul smelling stuff. What? Really? You're a scientist now too? It's very astute. So the sheriff lives out in this weird, rundown-looking house or building or something. Mary Posa comes by to borrow some cable from him, and he just has these various electrical cables hanging on hooks outside his house. Miles of cable. And I like how she just comes by demanding some cables, and he's like, you can't come in here, and she's just trying to walk right up. I mean, she could have called first or something. So she goes up by herself. Eddie's already had a run-in with the sheriff, and the sheriff doesn't like him. When she's going to drive away in her Jeep, Eddie pops out and does this weird face and makes all these weird noises. And the sheriff's like, I'm going to get you for that. He's yelling at him. And the sheriff says, you don't have any respect. And he calls him a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> 
You weirdo! So Eddie and Mariposa go up to the graveyard. Eddie has kind of a weird speech about how much he loves his animals, and then about his weird experience with the mutant sheep. And there's this weird woman hiding in the graveyard, spying on them and listening to what they're saying. When he's describing his vision of what he saw, it sounds like the most beautiful, grandiose thing. It seemed like the whole sky opened up, filling the barn with gold dust. And I skip back in the movie, because that's not what it looked like. It does not look like what he was describing. Oh, it was beautiful. Like in the Bible. What part of the Bible is he talking about? The weird lady that's watching, it's Madame Alta. So then Mariposa goes to Madame Alta, who's in this whole fortune teller getup with a crystal ball and everything. And Madame Alta tells her all this bad stuff's going to happen and blah, blah, blah. And at one point, Mariposa says, Psychic phenomenon is an extension of natural law, a science, not superstition. But she's right in front of a fortune teller. She went there herself. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was really funny. So when she does tell her about things that are going on or that are going to happen, she doesn't believe her about those things. But at the same time, she's like, how did you know about these other things? Why is she giving her money if she's not going to listen to what she's saying? And if she doesn't believe her in the first place, it doesn't make any sense. So Dr. Clemens is digging up where he thinks some answers are in the mines. And it looks like he's pretty close to Mariposa and some phosphorus gas starts leaking out and she starts choking and she's making all these struggling sounds and she's bumping into all the walls and she's in serious distress. And Dr. Clemens seems to not even notice it. And later we see that the gas is originating from right from where he's digging. It's being released by his digging but he's not affected by it at all, and she's the one that gets kind of knocked out by it. Yeah, I thought that was weird too. I want to talk about the way he's digging up these supposed fossils too. They're clearly not embedded in solidified rock or even solidified dirt. They're just kind of buried in here, but he's using a tiny little brush to brush away the dirt, and then he just yanks these bones out because they're clearly not buried. Just freaking pull the bones out. I mean, <laughs> you could just say, you know, these were unearthed by the miners or something. It looks ridiculous with him using this tiny, it's smaller than a toothbrush, to dig out these big bones that he just then yanks out of the dirt. Barnstable represents the Reich Corporation, who wants to buy up the land. Silverdale doesn't want him to buy up the land, so they have to get rid of Barnstable. So the plan to get rid of him is to have the sheriff take his dog, who is really good at playing dead, and have the dog lie down and pretend that Barnstable shot the dog to get everybody mad at him. Barnstable is shooting at glass bottles at some festival. He's not even aiming anywhere near the dog. He would have to turn 90 degrees and aim at the ground to shoot the dog. So the dog lies down and the sheriff just says, you shot my dog out of nowhere. I thought they were trying to make him think that the bullet must have ricocheted and hit the dog. But then Barnstable himself says, I also like the fact that they're firing off all these guns at these bottles that are, you know, 10 feet away. There's obvious danger of stuff flying at people. And there's a huge parade going by right next to them. There's <laughs> kids running around. You know, there's all this crap going on. There's people everywhere. I like when he's apologizing to everybody for shooting the dog. He's still waving his gun around. He's pointing it at everybody in that group. <laughs> <laughs> so when the sheriff's dog supposedly dies you know i get that he liked his dog but i mean they have like a whole coffin a whole funeral procession with all these townspeople and everything with a whole you know presentation and eulogy and all this stuff for a, a dog then sheriff sideburns reveals that his dog was just plain dead <laughs> okay the plan worked perfectly or whatever it's still the dumbest plan in the world <laughs> yeah <laughs> the sheriff said I shipped him down to my nephew. But then when he opens the coffin, it makes dog sounds. I'm still confused. So Silverdale wants to preserve the historical and environmental integrity of the town and not sell out to the billionaire industrialist. But he set up as the bad guy. That was my issue with it. Yeah. Barnstable wants to buy up land. Just, you know, say we're not selling it to you. You don't have to try to scare them away. Yeah, when Barnstable's going to all the townspeople to try and buy up their land, it plays out like a Little Rascals montage. Yeah, with this goofy... Uh... Honky-tonk piano music. I think they, they just put it in there because it sounded Western. I think that's all they thought about. And we're supposed to chuckle. You know, <laughs> that Barnstable. Are we though? Can't buy anyone's. I mean, no, I no, I I don't know. Yeah, it's it's Just, weird. I I mean, Barnstable's position, like you're saying, like Silverdale and Barnstable feel like they would be swapped 
in another movie as far as who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. But Barnstable is the closest thing to a, a likable character in this movie. Mm-hmm. And he's he's almost the... I mean, he's pretty much innocent. He's just doing his job. And everybody keeps trying to, you know, screw him over and lock him up for things that he didn't do. It's weird. So in between all this stuff going on, we get some more scenes in the lab and nothing important is happening. Somebody changed the channel back to the other movie. So Eddie and Mariposa are making out in the lab as soon as Professor Clemens leaves. And we hear the the monster doing all this roaring and they just don't react to it at all. They just keep making out. And then it just cuts to the next scene. So at one point, Philip Moldov is walking by where these kids are having a pie eating contest. And Eddie convinces these kids to throw their pies at Philip. And he gets super pissed, understandably. And Barnstable's acting like a jackass. And again, that's the closest thing to a likable character we have. I don't know how you're supposed to look at some of these scenes as a viewer, how you're supposed to feel about these characters. When Philip gets hit by the pies, and he's got it all over his face, the next clip cuts to him shaving. Is he shaving with the pie cream? (laughs) (laughs) I didn't think about that. Yeah, that's funny. So then Moldov decides he's going to get revenge on Barnstable once and for all. So he invites him back for drinks, and they're talking... And Barnstable reveals that Moldov used to work in New York and he committed a bunch of shady deals. And Moldov denies and says, that's all lies. There's people out to get me. And then he immediately tries to make a shady deal with Barnstable. And he tells him if, you know, I'll help you get the land and you'll get a cut. But I get a cut too. When Barnstable is going to leave, Moldov attacks him from behind, knocks him out. And then to make things look like Barnstable was the attacker, he shoots himself in the arm. Supposedly, there's no blood. There's no anything. Nothing in the path of the gunshot gets broken. <laughs> I mean, you can see the gun. The slide doesn't move or anything. It might even be a fake gun. And he puts the gun in Barnstable's hand. They could at least have put the gun out of the shot when he was supposed to have fired and just, you know, made put the gunshot in there. Yeah, put the camera on his face and make him grimace or whatever. Yeah, I guess they couldn't afford another camera cut in there. I like how the sheriff, regardless of what he's wearing, he always has his badge on. <laughs> He's very proud of his role in the community. (laughs) Barnstable gets locked up. The door that he's locked behind is like a chicken wire cage kind of thing. I don't know what it is. And he's in there without a shirt. And of course, he's pissed that he's locked up because he didn't do anything. He doesn't even know why he's there. But the mayor and everybody's against him. Maldorf says, Barnstable comes to us representing the largest mining interests in the world. Reich International. Are we to let this opportunist buy our land? Poison our air! Law and order will form the backbone of our resolve. And keep in mind, this is the bad guy. This is the bad guy making the speech about looking out for the good of the town. It doesn't make any sense. So it's turning out that the crony of the billionaire industrialist is the good guy. (laughs) Which also doesn't make any sense. They take him to the dump and they say, we're going to kill you and say you tried to escape, and you just died. Madam Alta is driving by. She pulls up and she says, We can make it to Indian Flats. I think Cyrus Clemens will help us. Hey, I'm from the movie shooting over there. You want to come with me? <laughs> it's like blazing saddles all over again. Moldov and his crew are going after Barnstable. They start shooting things up, and it causes Dr. Clemens to come out, and he says, You can't disturb me. I got a live animal in here. So the sheep monster escapes. Their hibernation shots or whatever they've been giving it wear off. And this is the first time that we really see the monster in a way where you can tell what's happening in the frame. And it's a weird looking sheep thing with like one arm is really long and floppy. (laughs) The other arm is a little more normal. And it's got a weird head that looks like it's made out of clay or something. And when it walks around, it just kind of stumbles and shuffles from side to side, bumping into things everywhere and making all these growling noises. The first full view of it reminded me of the creatures from the village. Okay. (laughs) But just for that first shot. Afterwards, it did not anymore. Keep in mind, Barnstable has only been dealing with this overzealous and fanatic conservationist. And all of a sudden, he's being thrown into the thing, basically, of this sheep embryo science experiment monster creature gone wrong. What is he thinking at this point, you know? Yeah, he's definitely the the character we're supposed to root for, but he doesn't really do anything after this. He kind of just runs away most of the time. I even made a note. I said, where the hell is Barnstable? And they showed up in the last minute, I think. Yeah. Murray Poses says, Maybe the monster is some sort of sign. What does that mean? Well, regardless, she was the one knocking the fortune teller earlier, telling her that there's no such thing as superstition or signs or messages. It's all science. It's all backed in science. 
It doesn't make any sense, and it's really weird and out of place. And it doesn't come up later in the movie either. It doesn't have anything to do with anything else. And the monster has so little to do for the entire plot of the movie. And it's not the fact that they don't show it. Some of the best horror movies don't show the monster. But it's not part of the plot or events or anything that happens in the entire movie until the last 10 minutes. And then even then, when it seems to be becoming a monster hunting movie, they throw that away anyway. So Mary Posa goes after the monster to try to be friendly with it and stop anybody from killing it. And she says, I've been following you all the way from the glory hole. What is she talking about? What does that mean? <laughs> I don't know what that means. Is that the name of the ranch? I don't know. Because that's a I don't, not great name for a ranch. Yeah, I don't remember them ever saying that earlier. So she starts trying to lure the monster back by doing all these weird, like, caresses and kind of <laughs> dance kind of things. It made me think kind of of... Uh, the Black Widow and the Hulk, the way she kind of tries to calm him down or whatever in the movies. But it was weird. I was thinking the Sylvia Marsh from Lair of the White Worm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then Eddie runs after her because he doesn't want her to get hurt. Everything's fine. She's not being attacked or anything. But he just picks up a big rock and throws it and doesn't even hit the monster. <laughs> <laughs> and it scares it away. So the monster goes on a very minor rampage through the countryside. Scares some kids away. We've seen how that thing moves. It's not chasing people. Yeah, we can see in the scene where it comes up on these kids. It's moving so slowly. It's in broad daylight. It's going from really far away to really close. It's a really long shot. It's awful. Silverdale enacts martial law. And as a private citizen, you can't do that. I don't care how much property you own or how influential you are in your community. You can't do that the gas station part the monster knocks over one of the pumps and there's nothing attached inside i like how the guy throws his little torch purposefully not at the monster but to the <laughs> side of it to make sure it hits the gas yeah and then everything explodes the music to me sounds like it's heroic music here which doesn't make any sense <laughs> So at this point, the monster is really not bad. The billionaire industrialist is also good. His crony is good. The mad scientist is good. The environmental conservationist is bad. And all of law enforcement is bad. It seems to be the opposite of the way every other movie is. I don't know. It's just weird. Yeah. So at the end, when they decide to capture the monster, they got 50 people to take down this mini snuffleupagus. They're all <laughs> super intense about it, but it can't move quickly. It can't attack them. It can't do anything. It's just sitting there. Well, I do like the fact that they try to capture it instead of just shooting it up or something. Silverdale wants to use it as an attraction to make money. Which makes sense. It made me think of the Valley of Guanji, because instead of roping an Allosaurus and putting it in a circus, they're trying to rope this god monster and put that on display. And it's also a Western. So I did want to talk a little bit at the end. So everything Silverdale could possibly do to make things worse, he does in a sequential order. First, he tells everybody that he sold their land to the Wright Corporation which is what he himself publicly has been fighting since the beginning of the movie. Then, he tells everyone that the mines are going to open back up, and it's going to continue to strip the land, which again, he has publicly fought since the beginning of the movie. Then, he tells everybody that tourists will be flocking to the town and ruining the historic culture, which again, he has publicly fought since the beginning of the movie. Then, when everyone's in an uproar, he reveals the monster that killed people in the town and ruined parts of their town, and everyone just starts going after it. And then when everyone freaks out, he starts screaming at people with guns to make them pay. I'm not even sure who he was talking about. And he's laughing like a maniac. Make them pay! Make them all pay! He tells them to run them down a few times. Everything he could possibly do to make bad worse, he does. In order. I thought the ending was the best part of this movie because of how crazy it got. I mean, none of this movie made any sense, but that ending was just so over the top. Out of left field. It came out of nowhere. Everyone's character type and motivations. It's, I wouldn't even say a 180. I would say they went to a totally different axis. Up to this point, everything Silverdale has done has worked out for him. He could come out on top and never have to worry about anything else again, as far as this movie's concerned. He is entirely responsible for everything that happens at the end of the movie. Corrupt, bad shit he's doing just out in public and says, yeah, I did it. Yeah, and then kill everybody that's opposing me at this point, out in front right. of everybody. I thought it was interesting they hold that whole town meeting on the teetering edge of the dump. There's no better place to do that. <laughs> I have dedicated my life to the restoration of this famous Bonanza City now. Barnstable barely shows up at the very end. Eddie, Mariposa, and the doctor are there, but they don't really do much. By this point, nothing really matters as far as that stuff goes. We didn't talk about where the sheep monster came from. 
So those gases that are escaping from the mining... They came out on the other side of the mountain, which is where Eddie's sheep ranch is. So when the credits are rolling, and it goes back to that Wild West ending music, and you have your Wild West font... If someone walked in at this point and said, oh, you just finished watching a Western? I'd say, yeah. And they'd be like, which one? I'd say, let me show you. And then I would go back three minutes (laughs) to that whole chaotic mess. The tone shifts so dramatically from one minute to the next. And this movie feels like it has messages of some kind. It's trying to convey some kind of ideas about society or about business practices or something. But I have no idea what those messages are. Yeah, I don't know. So, The God Monster of Indian Flats. I'm glad I watched it. I don't know if I'd watch it again. I wouldn't watch it again. But it was definitely worth it one time. Yeah, definitely worth one experience. Really bad special effects, really weird monster, really strange, meandering storyline. Very disjointed. It's potentially interesting at points. It just doesn't quite live up to its own potential. It wants to say something, but it's unclear as to what it's trying to say. It's kind of unclear as to why this movie exists. The whole time it feels like it's being pulled in 12 different directions all at once. But it's definitely unique. It's definitely interesting. At one point, Silverdale says, Time is the eternal judge of events! Which I think encapsulates this movie perfectly. (laughs) God Monster of Indian Flats, check it out. It's a 1 out of 10.